next to land, the room is on the sea. The promise that they hold is joint prosperity. We're breaking barriers, we're making history. The war we're dreaming of. Tu che hai visto? Poi ti mando a fare una cosa. Ma è buona la Enjoy life. <laughs> Ой, 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 ой,
。又下大雪啦！Welcome to the fourth day of Symposium As You Go, The Roads Under Your Feet Towards a New Future. Today's panel will be moderated by Aigarim Kapar, who is part of what could should create Hindu family. Aigarim is an interdependent curator, cultural activist, founder of Artcom Platform, and initiator of Org Art Collider Alternative School. She is based in Kazakhstan and continues to live and work between Astana and Almaty. In curatorial practice, Kapar focuses on post-colonial and decolonial discourse in Central Asia. Kapar curates and organizes research based on exhibition, urban art interventions, discussion, lectures, and workshops. To accomplish such a wide-ranging initiatives, she often collaborates closely with art and educational institutions, as well as scientific apparatuses. In 2015, she founded Artcom community-based contemporary art and public engagement platform. In 2017, Aigarim initiated Art Collider, an alternative school when art meets science and technology. In 2020, she joined What Could Should Curate Hindu Belgrade International Curatorial Program Core Team. Aigarim will introduce you topics of the today panel and the presenters. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Viliana, for inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm Aigirin Kapar from Artcom Platform. I'm situated in Almaty and speaking from my home. Uh, welcome to the first day of the As You Go Roads Under Your Feet Towards the New Future Symposium. I'm glad to be here with all of you. The main symposium presenters are What Could Should Creating Do and Moderna Galleria organized by Viljana Cilic. Uh, symposium is the first public moment of sharing as you go roads under your feet towards the new future. It's a long-term project and research inquiry that reflects on the Belt and Road Initiative and how it will alter the aesthetics and practices of everyday life in different local contexts of Ethiopia, Serbia, Slovenia, Uzbekistan, China, and Kazakhstan. Today's panel is titled Situated Research, Situated Practices, and it utilizes Donna Haraway's 1988 essay, Situated Knowledges, the Science Question in Feminism, and the Privilege of Partial Perspective as its point of departure. Our speakers today are Kaya Kraner and Robert Bobnich, Yabe Balfantai from Astrobus Ethiopia, and artist Jasvi Den. Uh, this panel will further explore the uh, situatedness within their local context and their practices embedded within this to explore what it means to be connected to a place and ultimately to one another. At the end of the panel, uh, we will have Q&A session. Uh, you could leave your questions in comment section here or on Facebook. And also, please uh, experience toolkit through link on what could should create in the website. Uh, researchers and cells were invited to provide tools for listening, seeing, smelling, touching, and testing that could overcome our physical distance. I hope uh, spirits of the Wi-Fi connection and live streaming platform will be supportive to us and everything will go well. Now, I would like to introduce the first speakers, Kaya Kraner and Robert Pognich. Uh, Kaya Kraner is an independent researcher in the field of philosophy, sociology, and theory of art based in Ljubljana. She holds a PhD in humanities. Kaya was an editor of the 
art theory oriented radio program on Radio Student Ljubljana and has been a member of the editorial board of Shum Journal, as well as a member of its research team. Her current research interests include the aesthetics of visual art models of temporality in art, epistemology of art, and art historiography. Uh, Robert Bognich is a PhD student of media studies at the Faculty of Social Science at the University of Ljubljana and a researcher at the University of Ljubljana, Center of Culture and Religious Studies. His research interests include popular music, sounds, cultures, media technologies, and technoscience with a focus on this history and epistemology of technology. Uh, Kaya and Robert will share their ongoing research, Bor is Burning, from mining to data mining in socialist Yugoslavia. Bor was one of the iconic places of Yugoslav industry and consequently one of the mythological places of proletarian and industrially induced socialist culture. After the anticipated future bloody collapse during the 90s, uh, the Boer mine was sold to the Chinese state-owned Xinjiang Corporation in 2017 as part of the Chinese investment in the Balkan region. In Boer, copper and gold mining dates back to the at least 5000 BC, is a place of particular synthesis between the geological past and technological future. Being the perfect example of Yuku's concept of cosmotechnics, cosmotechnics can be understood as a means of reaffirming relations between nature, culture, techniques and cosmos, uh, stating that te technical and scientific thinking have always merged under sociological, cosmological imagination. Uh, their aim is to question the supposedly uniform development and understanding of technology at the modern Western context based on the case study of Bohr. Uh, Kaya and Robert, please welcome. Bohr is burning, as the name of a Bohr's local rock band Goribor is suggesting. But it has been burning since the prehistory as the geological and archeological evidence indicates. There is an in inherited greatness in the Bohr soil, located in the southeastern part of Serbia, perhaps for this reason in Yugoslav socialist mythology, Bohr mining facilities were the construction site of the anticipated communist future and the town itself was modernized in the period of accelerated industrialization in post-war Yugoslavia. After the anticipated future bloodily collapsed during the 90s and the land was deteriorated, Bohr's mine was sold to the Chinese state-owned Xinjiang Corporation in 2017 as part of the Chinese investment in the Balkan region. The technique of mining could be understood as the founding technique in the formation of human culture. It is the technology for the exploitation of the deep geological time of the earth and the basis upon which the whole history has been ramified. This was also reflected in the culture of mining itself, from the supposedly special social and magical status of miners in the prehistoric cultures to the mythological features, superstitions, and the rituals of modern mining workers' culture, such as the cult of patrons or the cult of mining dwarf. It is important to note that the special magical and superstitional features of mining survive to this day, also in Yugoslavia, traversing the day of miners on the 6th of August. But there is more for magic and science in the mining than the open-ended play of symbols. From the technique of mining, the metallurgy was born, but also modern geology and archaeology, a forms of reasoning and calculation about the progressive evolution of the earth or human dwellings encapsulated in the stratified matter. Deleuze and Guattari, a French philosophical duo, is stating, because metal is the pure productivity of matter, those who follow metal are producers of objects par excellence. <clears throat> End of quote. 
metallurgy for which mining is its source is an enactment of a technological variation as such, traversing the cultures and the ages. If you follow the mediation between the geological and anthropological reality, between the human history and the history imminent to the earth, which assumes the earth itself is constituted as a living system being constantly created by living processes as characteristic, especially for Western modernity, the mining could be understood as a technique of mediation between the two, producing a hole into the deep time of geological sedimentation, extracting the material for human technological development, and consequently presenting a moving force of human history. For this reason, it is possible to enact geocosmic nature of thinking, uh, thinking as such, mixing prehistory and history, pursuing different connections between the times including the deep time of Earth's transformations and vastness of the cosmos before modern technological science reflected in different local traditions. Understanding of mining as a particular synthesis between the geological past and technological future is especially pertinent in the case of Bohr, where mining dates back at least to the Neolithic and Neolithic era and also being the largest copper mine in the European part of the Ottoman state in, uh, in the 16th century, a prime mover of the Serbian medieval state's growth, and when being nationalized in 1945 by the socialist regime, becoming the construction site of the anticipated communist future, and currently being the part of Chinese investment in the Balkan region. For that reason, mining presents a perfect example of Yuk Hui's concept of cosmotechnics, by which he is asking why modern technological development and its corresponding globalization did not take place in China or some other cultures with advanced pre-modern technological settings. According to Hui, the answer lies in a different understanding of techniques, for which he constructed the concept of cosmotechnics. This means that techniques emerge as a part of particular cosmology. And also, as we must add, that cosmology as the understanding of the order of things, so the way things are, reflected in the form of magic, mythology, or especially pre-modern science, is enacted by technical means. For example, architecture, calendars, maps, alchemy, telescope, mining, or computing. Cosmotechnics, therefore, claims development of specific technical means or facts is dependent on the experience of techniques that is not universal and is partially conditioned by cosmology. Different cultures may have similar calendars, yet different concepts and experiences of time, and by it also different usages of technical means. For that reason, the concept can be understood as an epistemological tool with which Hui is reaffirming relations between nature, culture, techniques, and cosmos, stating that technical and scientific thinking emerges <clears throat> under cosmological conditions in the relation between humans and their particular geographical milieus. Following Hui, Hui, we could say there is not only different technological thinking embedded in the Western and modern conception and capitalist expansion, which is now returning, in the form of Chinese capital and sino-futuristic paradigm of the digital future, but different cosmotechnical traditions. Apart from being an economic activity, the technique of mining functioned as a particular cosmotechnics, embedded in lo local cosmologies and mythologies, even after the development of modern technological science, as we tried to indicate before. It was also provided uh, a particular relationship with the earth and geological time. Nevertheless, for Hui, Sinofuturism is only an acceleration of the European modern project, which as such presupposed scandering its local cosmotechnical traditions and adoption of European detachment of techniques from cosmology that occurred during the general development of modern Western science, especially from 16th century onwards. Modern Western scientific revolution from that period introduced exactly the destruction of thinking about natural, 
cultural processes and their relation based on the ancient notion of cosmos, denoting the whole cosmic order and harmony where each thing has a determined place and when this and where discovering this natural place leads to the path of maintaining natural pre-existing order as opposed to chaos. Western science replaced the notion of ancient co cosmic order for infinite universe, which in the first phase includes the replacement of concrete space with abstract space of Euclidean geometry, which will henceforth be understood as real. This replacement of the idea of hierarchically ordered finite world structure for an open, indefinite and even infinite universe, united and governed by the same universal laws, implies that scientific outlook eliminates all consideration, consideration based on value, on perfection, on harmony, on meaning and on purpose. In other words, modern Western science eliminates ethic and morals as its integral parts. When abstract space of Euclidean geometry has become understood as the real space, one of the main methodological innovations of modern Western science can occur, namely replacement of observation and experience of concrete material world in order, in order to get hold of the logic of its order for experiment as the methodological interrogation of nature. Further, furthermore, rest of modern science either eliminates the idea of, of the harmonious order of the world as its subject completely, while leaning on potentially eternal and more or less random and causal development, such as evolution, which is also amoral, or introduces the idea of the world order as something that is yet to be achieved, meaning it replaces the broken link with ethics and morals for politics. <clears throat> The common point of both options is that they are based on the temporality of progress or more, more neutral logic of change. <clears throat> the latter represents the basis for understanding of technology as the developmental force of human progress as materialized in the idea of universal modernization. On the one hand, modern scientific understanding of technology therefore rests exactly on this interrupted relationship of techniques, locality, ethics, and morals, where local technological know-how and cosmotechnical traditions are replaced by the planetary industrial machine. On the other hand, modern scientific understanding of technology rests on the associated milieu of geocosmos as a standing reserve for the industrial production and the speculative cosmologies on the base of computational technology. Geocosmos as a standing reserve here not only means Geocosmos is being consti constituted as something at human disposal to exploit, but above all marks epistemological limit of modern Western science. It means that even though modern Western science eliminates the idea of immutable nature and by it attributes it life and history of its own beyond the human one, this very operation is actually a form of breakage of the bond between the geocosmos and anthropological milieu, creating separated realms of the natural and the cultural, whereby this very natural is naturalized in order to be able to become a st st starting point to plan technological development. In other words, it means application of human scale planning or politics on naturalized nature by, by which radical changes that actual technological development induces on nature could not be perceived, comprehended and consequentially anticipated, at least till the development of 20th century ecology. The Industrial Re Revolution as the socio-economic effect of the aforementioned modern understanding of technology is thus accompanied by the control revolution and control of social and eco economic systems through information technologies. An organicist paradigm of science that also enabled 20th century inquiries into the ecological system of the earth and consequently the contemporary ecological thought. In this sense, information technologies are presuppose ecology. The latter is materialized, especially in the form of general science of cybernetics, which functions as an epistemic unified cosmotechnics without a specific locality and can as such present a technological thinking implemented in the framework of any particular either social uh, humanist or natural science. 
Far from the fact that cybernetic thinking had marked the end of cosmotechnics, cybernetics subsumed it uh, to its own informational understanding of automation. Norbert, Norbert Weiner, the founding father of cybernetics, gave us a true cosmotechnical lecture. The thought of every age is reflected in its technique. The civil engineers of ancient days were land servers, astronomers, and navigators. Those of the 17th and early 18th century were clockmakers and grinders of lancers. As in the ancient times, the craftsmen made their tools in the image of the heavens, end of quote. But as we saw, the heavens have changed and so did the hell of the underworld. The 19th century is also the century of the steam engine. Capital ex expansion, thermodynamics, and preoccupation with energy for which fossil fuel mining become an essential technique. <clears throat> Speaking of fossil fuel mining in the first decades of the 21st century is above all speaking of ecological crisis. But there is something that feels so obsolete about coal and other dust. At, as you see, Parika reminds us. Parika considers technological development of digitalization in capitalist societies, and, and he quickly adds that mines are a central part of IT too, meaning that the hardware side of a planetary communication or computation, computational system is based on the mining of materials such as copper, accompanied by the horrendous condition of modern day miners, the ecological crisis and the geostrategic geo power play. Nevertheless, if there is something that feels obsolete about mining, it means that the 20th century has surpassed the age of the steam engine and thermodynamics. In other words, mechanical machines in the form of information, informational technologies and cybernetics. In other words, organicist machines based on complex recursive algorithms. It is an age of self-regulated control systems operating on communication with the environment, encapsulating the biological, technical, and social systems. The techniques of mining, be it mining of material or data, have become incorporated in the body of Bicephalus camera of energy and information mediating between the hardware and software of industrial and informational revolutions. The formation of cybernetic and informational thinking stems from the crisis in control of the increasingly complex, complex modern capitalist societies. In the words of James Benninger, revolution in control technology did indeed come in response to a crisis in the economy's capability to process throughputs. For this reason, new technologies for the processing and exchanging of information were developed, including, of course, computer technologies and the global communication machine. Local technological mentalities were gradually swept away and cybernetical paradigm enrolled in the techno-capitalistic expansion in the last decades has, in his words, completed the detachment of technology from a particular local milieu. As who is saying, it underestimates the milieu by reducing it to mere functionality based on feedback. And consequently, it forms a looming, again in whose words, non dualistic totalizing power present in modern technology. Nevertheless, the crisis of control was not reserved for the capitalist societies, but for the socialists as well. We are all, we are familiar with the Soviet Union's failed attempts to build an informational network, actually the internet, for the management of the national economy. We are also familiar with the Chilean project of Cybersyn to optimize the decision-making about the production capabilities of the state under the rule of socialist Salvador Allende, coming to a premature end with the coup in 1973. It is therefore important to note that the modern Western technology did not take the uniform route and that it was submerged to the different political and social understandings, implementations, visions, and speculations. Even from the perspective of cosmotechnics, 
emphasizing the global power of modern technology in the form of cybernetic paradigm and informational technologies for which data mining serves as a transformed technique of mining, the understanding and implementation of totalizing tendency in technology has been realized in the context of power struggles, power struggles of prevailing political and economical powers. First of all, in the context of Cold War and military industri industry, then in the context of economic globalization in which China is now taking its part and the post-industrial and the post-industrial places such as Bohr, largely based on a past technological settings such as mining has been bereft of its particular and sustainable socio-geographic milieu. So what about socialist Yugoslavia? A federal state built from the scratch after the World War II with an accelerated pace of industrial modernization and the system of, third, of a third way nationalized economy. It is still a largely under research question waiting for the proper historical analysis. But in the meantime, we can return to Bohr's mining complex being one of the first industrial complexes in Yugoslavia where computer technology has been installed, mainly for management purposes. In 1959, the Univac 60, a punch card electronic tube computer was installed in Bohr's mining company for the purpose of administrative use. It was one of the first computers bought by a Yugoslav company in the early years of the implementation of computer technology. The installment of computer technology in Bohr's mine industry also provided a great deal of enthusiasm for programming programming education um, as the former engineer with whom we spoke during um, our visit to board was stating and emphasizing. Therefore, it is reasonable to say that the influence of the computer system in Bohr's mining company was much wider than its importance for the company itself. Uh, also another quote from um, some other engineer there. The importance of computing in Bohr is also indicated by the establishment of the computer center in the Copper Institute, founded in 1962, where the data processing of production processes and financial transactions was performed. In the following decades, the computer team from Bohr worked as an educational unit and they also offered their support for the Yugoslav army. Uh, in the 80s, um, <clears throat> more exactly in 84, uh, the ICL, so another uh, computer from the company called ICL, uh, mainframe computer was installed at the center and uh, an informational network was established between three different industrial complexes, including a 400 kilometers distant chemical plant. The system performed data processing on copper production, transport, delivery, salary calculation, and so on. The ladder was also expanded outside the company, including local municipality and schools. The computer technology in Bohr was actually all imported, but development of computation in Yugoslavia was not, was not limited to the acquisition of uh, foreign technology. Actually, Yugoslavia was one of the first states to invest in its own technological development. The early engineering staff was educated abroad and the components for the computers were important. But Yugoslav scientific research in the fields of computer technology and robotics soon proliferated. In the 1950s, famous Yugoslav computer scientist Branko Socek, later known for his work on neural networks and general intelligence, established the Laboratory of Cybernetics at Ruger Boschkovic Institute in Zagreb today's Croatia. A year later, the first digital computer in the CER series was constructed by Mikhailo Pupin Institute in Belgrade, being one of the first independently developed computers in Europe. In the next, next decades, the domestic development of computers expanded, including the companies such as Elektronska Industria Nish in Serbia and Iskra here in Slovenia and also the development of um, very popular home computer 
called Galaxia in 1984. But even before the PC, so um, personal computing uh, technology, personal computer, significantly transformed the application of computer technology in the late 80s and the following dominance of Western software industry, meaning the unification of the interface level of the global computational system, for example, uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows, the Yugoslav computer development started to decline. One of the reasons was that the domestic computer manufacturer was very limited. The series were made in actually five to 10 pieces, meaning that despite some serious scientific leverage, informational technology was never really a serious part of the Yugoslav economic and social vision. Speaking of the computer industry in the late 70s, one of the creators in the Museum of Science and Technology in Belgrade is saying, Yugoslavia was one of the first to recognize the need for such a development, but it did not succeed in capitalizing it to produce and place the product. It was the same on the level of PC. Mm. From today's spontaneous perspective, largely held by technological globalized world, the development and implementation of informational technology and concurrent technovision of the future is seen as an imminent part of the capitalist system. But before the disruption of socialist states and development of the development of informational technology and the cybernetic paradigm of management were not exclusive, exclusive to the Western capitalist system, mainly of the United States, they were also an important part of the future machine of socialist societies. Thus, the question is not only to what extent, but also under what conditions. Our research therefore followed the inquiry if implementation of cybernetic thinking and computer technology in socialist Yugoslavia, and in specific case of Borg, can be perceived just as a mere side effect of wider production changes since the mid 20th century onwards, and if socialist Yugoslavia had a political plan to implement cybernetics on the Marxist or, or self-governing socialist ground, which presuppose a more basic question, what exactly does socialist implementation of cybernetics mean and how does it differ from the capitalist one? The existing contribution on the option of implementation of cybernetic on socialist political and economic ground roughly from 1970s have been focusing especially on social and productional conditions in which cybernetics was developed in the first place. Those were capitalist production conditions after the economic depression in 1930s that led to the so-called state capitalism that questioned capitalist hyperproduction as a result, allegedly imminent to private capitalist production mode as such. Primary aim of development of cybernetic management in capitalist framework was therefore not only to increase productivity, but above all to manage, but, all, but not also to eliminate inevitably destructive and conflict results that are imminent to modern industrial society, societies, especially class conflicts. Cybernetic management is therefore in its basis functionalist and had historically led to social democratic maintenance of, le of the level of quality of life for widest populations. Besides that, cybernetic managers, management also su suggests a synthesis of a plan versus mar market antagonism or centralization versus decentralization as embodied in Soviet, Soviet type and capitalist market economy by, at least in principle, function, functioning as a disseminated homeostatic network and operating in close to real time to facilitate instant decision-making and eschew bureaucratic protocols. According to Marxist contributions, cybernetic management of state economy and on socialist grounds supposed to above all include political vision of the future development, not only the dynamic maintenance of or reforming of the existing order. Besides that, specific type of form imminent to cybernetics, so mentioned disseminated homeostatic network, supposed to be inclusive and participatory, meaning it's supposed to present also homeostasis between top-down and bottom-up decision-making. In the process of our, our research, which was mostly based on talking with the formants who had been included into implementation of information technology in war, 
in different periods, as well based on study of existing theoretical and historical literature, and not, for instance, strategic, strategic documents on policies and the like, we have not found any information that would confirm there was the aim to implement cybernetics on economy management in socialist Yugoslavia, such as in the mentioned Chilean example or in the Soviet uni Union, where actual, actual ideas to connect whole country by information technology were developed, even though they were also marked as techno-utopian and gradually subjected to particular political interests. <clears throat> Even though there were some th theoretical contributions focusing on the topic, development of information technologies in socialist Yugoslavia was more or less random, a result of particular needs, individual initiative in the framework of particular companies such as Bohr, and also faced more obstacles than political stimulations. One of those obstacles was the very model of self-government self or self-management, which in Often, which is often historically analyzed in four main phases, namely administrative phase between 1945 and 50s, administrative self-governing phase between 1951 and 1965, market self-governing phase between 1966 and 1971, and the last phase from 1972 till the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Workers' inclusion into the process of decision-making was to the largest extent realized within the boundaries of particular factories. However, in particular case of Bohr and concerning the IT development, it led to the terrible problems to put an expert idea into practice, to use some of the, our informants' words, since particular idea had to be voted by at, le by at least 50% of all the employees of Bohr, for instance. At some point, that means uh, 50% of tw uh, 23,000 people. Based on our interviews with engineers and program programmers from Bohr, we can also conclude that they didn't have a particular situated understanding of computational technology. In other words, the particular technological variation was possible only before the standard, standard, standardized software came into existence during the late 80s and 90s. Everything has started with the mining, which for a thousand of years forms a particular synthesis between the past and the future. The Yugoslav socialist ideological framework understood this well, perhaps too literal. Its future machine was built on the understanding of human labor, based on mediation between human and nature and modeled, of, modeled on mining and metallurgy. This is not to say that the tr transformation from mining to data mining, presupposing the inhuman understanding of labor and consequent loss of geolocality in the distributed system of planetary com computation was not possible to understand in socialist terms, especially in the particular position of Yugoslavia as a Cold War's no, man la no man's land, desp despite it wasn't for different reasons. This to say that the crit critique of totalizing power of technology is redundant without the geo geogra geopolitical and economic layers, which are taking a new toll in a global comp computational machine, at least until the, the burning will be over. Kaya and Robert, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and thoughts. Uh, you have created fascinating scientific collaboration and we will continue our panel with Yababal Hantai and our next destination is Ethiopia. Uh, Dr. Yababal Hantai is an astrophysicist and data scientist. He is a co-founder of the 10 Academy Initiative, an online learning platform to train the next generation of data scientists in Africa. He leads the Astrovas Ethiopia project and is engaged in a number of data science work with COVID-19 response volunteer group. Yabebal is a fellow of the World Economic Forum, Young Scientist, a fellow of the Next Einstein Forum, a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Future Councils on New Metrics, 
Today, Yabe Balfantai will share his presentation, Astrolas Ethiopia, a dynamic response to fast changing challenges and opportunities. It is a mobile science art innovation initiative that is carried out by driving a vehicle across different locations in Ethiopia. The program's ambition is to stimulate critical thinking whilst also supporting the country's social and economic development. And this presentation will discuss previous events hosted by Astrovas Ethiopia and will also forecast upcoming events. Yebebal, uh, please, the road is yours. You may start. So, um, thank you so much for inviting me for and this symposium. And uh, my presentation is on Astrobus, um, and Astrobus is a project in Ethiopia, and its stated mission is stimulating a culture of critical thinking in Ethiopia. And if you want to learn more about the project, you can check the website that is listed there, um, and also you will find more information about it uh, on the Onwards You Go website. Next slide, please. So, what is it? Uh, what is Astrobus? What kind of project is, it is? In a nutshell, it is um, Ethiopian science, art, and technology role models traveling across Ethiopia to foster critical thinking and exchanging worldviews with young students across uh, the country. So this is just what you should understand. But conceptually, more in depth uh, would be. So the mission, as I stated, it is uh, about stimulating uh, critical thinking using science, our technology um, to inspire, empower, and connect generations, multiple generations. And I'll go more in detail on the next slide. So the motto of which is move, moving to inspire, empower, and connect, this is kind of combining two of our um, assets and challenges. And in the asset side, we have a lot of a team that is experienced in strategic critical thinking abstraction and composition, and we have multidisciplinary skill sets and uh, deep and local and global knowledge in, in the asset side. And in the challenge side, we have limited human power, role models, and we have large scale to cover, which is um, in terms of people 110 million, in terms of areas about 1.2 uh, million kilometers square, and mostly rural community and connected with poor infrastructure and we don't have uh, that much budget. So that's why this, this kind of this, to move, to inspire, move to the places where the students are and inspire, make them interested, empower and connect. Next slide, please. So the interpretation of this uh, motto is that we have in one side this the inspire. To inspire, we, we do what we do are the actions we do are, we simplify things, we expose, inner workings of you know how things work and we articulate them and we relate these strategies of thinking uh, in such a way that they see the value as well as they understand it that we think will inspire and to empower means for us to hold activities that actually the students whom we are interacting uh, are uh, can do and also not only that we share some valuable information valuable in their community valuable in, in, in their peers such that they can talk about it so talking about it sharing such that they can share it with other people uh, or so do and demonstrate we think are these elements of you know empower stuff so and also knowing people bringing known figures in the in the community known figures in the country will um, will empower them um, and then in the connection part to connect, um, this is where I would say the biggest part we play in the moving. And we are learning, exchanging worldviews. So we're taking people who are probably grew up there as well, also in some other areas, and we take them there and they learn about the country and the people there or the students there also learn about the people where they grew up. And while we are also moving, we are taking different culture. We are visiting different cultures and we're taking lessons from here to there and we are um, also helping the other culture to kind of get infused with the cultures that we uh, visited before. So that's the, this, the connection part is, I would say, the, the really the, the, the key element. In the principal side, so our principles, our project is defined with these uh, core principles and the first thing is that the 
the people and the activities we choose are uh, relatable. Uh, that means they install this I can also do it mentality. And we are building everything we do on local history, culture, and identity. And that is uh, to respect the target audience. We are not just imposing and giving them, but we're also taking and learning. So it's, it's kind of this sharing and exchanging wallet views. And we produce content. Content is our other principle, and it should be in the local language. We prepare books, posters, and flyers. And every event that we do is our research field trip. So we record things and disseminate and learning uh, what, what we got. And we prepare, we try to prepare well in advance as much as possible and apply also critical thinking in our uh, project planning, execution, and reporting. Next slide, please. So the team, um, it is coming and going. It's always um, getting enlarged, but the, the, peop, the team that we started with this project are 30 plus um, Ethiopian scientists, artists, and innovators. We have also non-Ethiopians international people who actually help us in different elements, including recording, making videos, uh, as well as also sharing ideas. Next. So the events we did so far in 2017, we did uh, eight, we covered eight cities, 40 schools, and we reached about 8,000 students. And the places we visited are kind of, you can see it here is just in the south, basically just uh, near south from Addis Ababa. And that is the uh, cities that you, you will see here in the slide. In 2019, two years after we did, um, we covered 3,000 kilometer driving to the border of uh, Eritrea and uh, coming back to Addis, starting from Addis and ending in Addis, we reached about 30 schools and we uh, also visited something like 5,000 students along the way. Next. This year, funded through uh, the project, the On Roads uh, project, uh, which who also organized this, this symposium, we are uh, visiting or we're planning to visit these uh, five cities. And this is in the deep uh, south, what we call it. And we start from Addis Ababa, we drive from Addis Ababa and arrive in Arbamen, so that's where we will start. And then we will have uh, to console Jinka, Saula, and there is also um, Dorze that we will visit. Um, next. So practically, just to, to give you an insight, what kind of projects and you know how we do it. Next. Um, so there are a number of projects in art, in science, in technology, and, uh, and basically, by art, we include fashion design, music, uh, and other elements. So this one is, for example, from the uh, 2017 and 2019 events. So these are selected, but the actual picture that you see is in 2019 in Gondar, where uh, one of an artist, a photographer, is showing his photographs and asking students to read the picture and write what they see and what they feel, and comparing what they see with what other people see. And that kind of allows them to, to kind of communicate with just one picture how many people see different things. Next. And this is the same in picture reading. This was in the pilot project we did in Addis Ababa before start driving. Um, again, this is uh, the picture reading part, but as you can see next to it also, there are a number of other projects that you see in the background. Um, but this was just a pilot in Addis. And this was in 2017, a fashion designer uh, in elementary, high school, uh, junior school, basically allowing people to start drawing what they, what they wear. And kind of basically, just most people probably have drawn many other things, but they haven't probably drawn something that they will wear. And she's kind of showing the abstraction element of clothes and design. And then later, she allows them also to see certain elements in their clothes. Next. And here in 2019, uh, an art project led by Sinkana, who is also presenting, I think, in this symposium. It is uh, the project called Imagine, and this is in Bahardar. Um, and these are basically the, we had this cutout board, cardboard, where students sit there and kind of imagine, and they drive. This is a kind of a vehicle, and they drive to an imaginative world. And they just basically tell the story, write the story, and narrate the story. And finally, their pictures are taken and kind of documented along with it. And this was really fun. And as you can see, a lot of people. And this one is a project in science. It's called Optics. And this is basically um, showing how light is propagating through different medium, but in particular, how 
how telescopes work, for example, how lights are focused, microscopes work. So this clearly just people can see um, for laser, using the laser and mirrors and lenses, they can see the light. So it's kind of, we are uh, trying to bring out what, how the science behind it is working and people can interact, move lenses, focus things, measure distances, focal lengths. So all of that uh, stuff. So next. Okay, so this is again an optics, but this is more focused on how telescopes work. Uh, these are team from the uh, Ethiopian Space Science Agency, as well as also Ethiopian Space Science Society. So this is the moon string. People are really excited about telescopes and we have, uh, later you will see, there are uh, telescopes observations, but this is just more showing what elements are uh, in the telescope and they are asked to kind of assemble it themselves. And here, as you see that the same telescope, they assembled and they can see it, it is during the day and they can see some distant objects uh, and also the same big telescope that is in the foreground also that uh, they will use later at night also to see stars. And we had also some stargazing. Again, this is one is in 2019, uh, again in Bahardar, I think this is from Bahardar. And this is more to see what the sun is in a safe way. And of course, there is a lot of instruction we give students not to see the sun, you know, it's damaging their eye, but uh, through these um, uh, sun gazing tools, they were able to see the sun and kind of, as you can see the smile, were experiencing what normally they don't, but which is a daily life. Again, here is stargazing for um, distant objects using really slightly powerful telescope and they will be able to see something that they saw by eye and they couldn't see, but now a uh, through a telescope focused. And this is at night. So people, uh, unfortunately, children are unable to come in these events. That's why we have this distant uh, ob object gazing, but this one is stargazing properly, then uh, they will be able to see the planets, uh, whatever visible in that era at that time the moon, if it's visible, uh, and also other stars um, and just kind of see how the telescopes again reflect. But mostly we, we just focus on, on planets because that's more exciting and Jupiter moons. And this is a project called Seedborn. So this is an agricultural project that uh, it's actually an international project, but these two people that you see them here are uh, making it in Ethiopia and they have their own initiative and startup on that. It's basically how do you hide a seed in such a way that you put it uh, in the ground and when it gets water, it will flourish. So it's basically, um, it helps, it kind of nurtures it while it's, it's like an egg. It's kind of nurtures it while it's still there, but when it gets the right environment, it blossoms. So you can then put it anywhere. And when, when it gets the right environment, I think it can store, the seeds can store up to something like a um, couple of years. I forgot the actual year, but this is kind of showing how, because mostly we are going to rural areas and this is connecting with them that, you know, there is a number of innovations and technologies that you can do in agriculture. And this is really one of the exciting, and we give them this, they make the seed bombs themselves, like they basically buy bomb, these are the seeds, and then they basically throw them wherever they want and they can just look, find every time when they come in that area, just to see if their, um, if their seed has blossomed. Sometimes it's tree, sometimes it's other elements. And this is uh, from 2017, it's robotics in the innovation side. So it's basically, again, there we had uh, these robots, but you know, the robots, they don't get it and we wanted them to be relatable. So what we wanted is that to then use whatever they learned at school and kind of explain how this robot works so that the kind of learning the school works, basically high school, and um, university, so some of them are in from university, just interpreting what they see. And also basically just uh, drag and drop uh, a graphical uh, coding, and they basically move objects and kind of interact with the technology. Again, this one is in 2019. This is coding music, it's really a fun project. Uh, we were using Sonic Pi. Um, and we were able to translate, basically codifying. So it's, it's people have, in particular in Africa, people really have the vibes and they understand music. And not only that, they get excited to just make music themselves. And most of them, like me, they don't uh, play musical instruments. While in here, we just show them like, 
look, if you just are able just to code it and just think about it, use the flow, dictate it in, in a programmatic way, you can actually make any music. And together with sensors that we fit, um, so this is like the virtual drum, air drum, and they kind of integrate it with the code and they can make whatever music um, they want because the, the coding, the sonic pile allows every type of, and they can record nature, put it, compose, decompose. So this was really a fun, another uh, innovation project. Again, so this is in the innovation sensing with a smartphone, because as I, I think one of our core principles that's just to give them something that they have. So computer they may not have, and they may not be able to code, for example. But with these phones, for example, most people at least can access smartphones uh, either their family and uh, or their relatives will have. And when they see the phone, instead of just seeing it as just only a communication tool, just something that they will call and get um, another person, but they can also see it as a technology which is filled with lots of sensors, lots of importance. So we ask them to basically measure their speed, their uh, using their accelerometer, translate this one also into music by moving this thing as a musical instrument. And we're also asking them to go up and down, measure the uh, air the air pressures, so the pressure sensors. And we basically allow them to explore generating sounds, measuring distances, and a, lot, a number of things. We use physics toolboxes and Google uh, Science Experiment Journal, so uh, it's called Google Journal. Uh, experiment journal. So we use a number of these apps and kind of streaming sometimes the sensors values, sometimes uh, just basically interacting with it and seeing the value inside the phone. So but basically getting benefit from that. And another element in the innovation side, we had a 3D pen just to, to demonstrate that, you know, all of these technologies, their really inner workings are sometimes what they already know. So melt something you know, when they do ports in, in some of the areas we travel, they basically what they have is that they um, they basically melt something and melt something and shape it. And 3D printers are doing similar, but we try to demonstrate that they first do drawing in the art spaces. The artists allow them to kind of understand and play with the lines and the pictures. And then they come here and they basically sign it with a 3D print and then play music with whatever uh, they think their impression. So kind of integrating these innovations in one in one go, uh, we have also a table. So basically, just these are different uh, ex projects that are going parallelly. And this is, as you can see, how students are flowing, how projects are, are, are distributed across the space. So usually we hold it in the university, we bring students to that university because universities are easy to access, to organize, and then we bring with the university buses, we bring students from different high schools, different elementary schools, and we allow them here just to basically interact. So it's kind of a science expo. So, so I talked about, you know, the entire, basically the different projects, how they are, but just let me mention, let me go through just how the process happens, like the pre-trip, the arrival, the expo, the moving in the post-trip. So, um, the forming the team is, of course, the key, and as well as not only forming the team, but as well as also arranging uh, with um, the universities we go, the countries, getting the official letters. These are, you know, number of administrations. It's much, very hard. Usually we work with partners like the Ethiopian Space Science Society, for example, in the last two years we worked with them to, so that because they have a, a network within Ethiopia, so we use their network and, and kind of arrange that. This year, we are actually, we did a pre-trip ourselves and formed local organizing committees. So that's what we do. And we also to form a team. Uh, usually we were connecting with people that we know and people, you know, from one person that we know to another. But this year we are improving that system. We are also having open call for artists to begin with, but um, that the artists would apply and we select uh, projects that would go with us. So, as I said, relatable means that we, of course, emphasize more on people who come from the areas to be coming. And if not, just people who speak the language, if not, people who are actually from, from the country, Ethiopia, such that the children can see their background. They don't just say, oh, okay, you know, uh, these things happen, but it's like they know this person, uh, his or her background, and what they went through. And that, uh, that relatability, we think, is very key, and therefore we focus on that. 
but we have also non Ethiopian friends who help us in, in different areas, advertising in social media, helping us uh, in those areas, traveling with us to document the event, share experience like uh, brainstorming with project ideas. So like we sometimes, we always have like these announcements and, and also some kind of uh, in social media kind of giving, kind of trying to connect, uh, paying even some little in Facebook to, to just because a lot of Ethiopians are in Facebook uh, who, who have basically uh, internet, they are in Facebook and we try to reach with them. And this year we have this open call, as you can see here in the website. And so, while together, once we form the team, once we have the team, we have this uh, the orientation day just a couple of weeks or months before, and we basically have a series of meetings between then and the event. We basically, the artists, the scientists, whatever, we meet and we kind of talk the essence of the project and how we do it and what is the, you know, the, the key element because everybody is doing their own thing. But ultimately, of course, we want to we wanna just go as a team and kind of giving um, giving them like these three key elements, which is connecting with them as role models and also learning from them as their cultures, their cultures and their history, and also then inspiring them with what we do, with what uh, we're, we're doing best and kind of giving them something that they, they can be they can be proud such that it empowers them. And in the day of the, the trip, usually we, is, a night before we sleep in a hotel, all of us together so that we can go early. And that's, and then this is just early in the morning, we come and the bus is there already and we just hop on and we start driving. So then once that, we arrive to the university and we expect by then that the organization happened, the students are called and they are basically being, um, Kind of informed so the only thing we have to do at, from then is just to get in there put our our materials in the next slide for example you will see that we just put out all our posters or our activities we start arranging tables and basically just setting it up if we arrive in the morning that will well, if we're up early in the morning or the night before that will happen in the morning and the event will happen in the in the evening if we arrive in the afternoon we do that in the afternoon and then that project will happen or the event will happen in the morning. And we usually, if there are um, uh, kind of calls that we can hold, we really just for a maximum of 30 minutes, we usually don't even arrive to 30 minutes, basically just to give them like why we are there and kind of asking them that this is not just, this is interact with us, ask us, greet us, kind of, you know, get the best out of it. So like we're not here just to, demo, to show you something, but we're here just to learn and also to, to give uh, what we have. So this will be just a very brief introduction uh, about the project. And then once the project is done, we basically just will be usually harder to wrap up. Actually, almost always the time we, again and again, we say like, let's pay, let's respect the time. And this, the hardest part was always just to leave to kind of every team member will be just like absorbing the event. And usually they, they just can't, can't even sense the time. And that's where we had really the hard time, but it's like means just departing with really a smile. Everybody's smiling, motivated to the next one and we depart um, that place. So, and then after that in the bus, right? Immediately after the bus, we talk about it. We document about like what went well, what of course, as I said earlier, most of the time, the mention that we should be time limit, time bound, let's respect time. But the last one, usually we, we basically fail in, in all of the aspects, like in all of the events, just getting out at the time that we say it usually is harder, but we evaluate it and we always, this motto, the next event, whether it's just the next city or the next year, we are improving over that. And that's why we actually are really proud uh, all the time we are, we are improving. And this is for just one uh, that really is just how people then send us. So they, we ask them feedback right there as well, but this is a person has found who sent us um, what, he feels what what he felt after we left and uh, saw our Facebook uh, page that he said he told us like my name is Tasfaun I attended your conference in Walaita Soto to be honest I really moved and inspired now my life is on a better track because of all the advice I got from you guys now I'm ready to accept any challenge on my way and turn into an opportunity so thank you so much and we really just these are our energy that the energy that motivates us and continue 
uh, the work that we do. So, and after that, with all the team, we send um, feedback, basically just the Google form, and we collect, of course, just the project areas, and if they are keen to be back, and that's really our metric, because if we do well, that means the people we, we want, the team that went with us got something, not only gave something, but really got something, got energy, got, you know, learned something. And, and as you could see, almost there is no single person who says no, but uh, more than, you know, 70, 80% basically says they will be back and 20% they say maybe because of time, because of other reasons, but really we take it as, um, as a good and our, the overall satisfaction that they have on the project, as you can see, is really um, extremely happy, most of them. And so projects. So here, of course, I would have normally played video um, and, but so here I will just mention without the video, um, the projects. And so here is the first one was on telescopes and, and just basically a video that summarized, but here is one that I really liked. This was more about um, living legacy and this, this, this person, he's a poet, but his main uh, focus on the project was, so there is this um, fingerprint that was left on a cave 40,000 years ago. And he starts with the question uh, of like, you know, why do you remember anything for five years ago? And then after the students deliberate on that, and if they remember anything, then he will ask them, write something that you remember in five years, such that, and you know, some of them are really crazy. Like for example, one person in Nakale, she's like a bit shy and she just jumped on the table and she said, I will not forget this. So it's something like really right there, uh, connection and it's really some of this small but kind of inspires and kind of gets into this idea of like uh, different elements in, in this in this case was legacy was the the, um, the, the the focus and this was on um, robot like on um, so the previous picture was on uh what like so this is water rocket but the students like asking them how how the interaction goes so in the video you would, you would see uh, that the just the students kind of interact from starting like what is a rocket and stuff to just doing performing a water rocket they pump it and they go but along each process uh it goes through like how the students react and interact so what is next um, of course, as I said earlier, next we have in May, the beginning of May, we will have uh, the next Astrobus event that is sponsored uh, partly by uh, the On Road project. And we are going to be doing very similar thing, but traveling to the south of the very, um, the Omo, the Omotic uh, Valley, the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, in the deep south. Um, so we did um, preparation, so already we did a pre-trip between 14 and 20 February, we went for one week and learned uh, a lot of stuff that I will show a picture and we have, or we have already opened a call for Ethiopian artists and uh, budget and activity are, uh, are completed, at least just with what we have. So we are still searching for, for uh, budget for funding. Uh, to complete these 10 days. If not, we'll only ha uh, have a budget for five days. Uh, and we're updating the website and reaching target audience using uh, social media. So just pictures. So these are the areas that, uh, that we will be going, but pictures from our pre-trip, just to show you what we learned uh, along our way. So this was first meeting with in Arbamench uh, and forming the after forming the local organizing committee. So the local organizing committee took us to the university. They will finish all the process with uh, Saula and um, uh, Arbamt. So they will be responsible for us. So we are in contact and they will help us in organizing. So this was just after completing the meeting. And this was in Jinka. So we had a tourist guide who's also our contact there who would help us in kind of bringing the audience there, like because Jinka, in Jinka there is this tribe called Ari, 
was really uh, marginalized. They are like uh, blacksmiths and painters, and basically they really want to have the uh, incredible culture in, in their hard workers and very clean and just incredibly clean uh, their area, their inside of the house. And so we wanted to bring also some of those people to our projects, showing their work together with us. And this was just visiting one of uh, a family there and kind of learning from them, from the family, how they live, what they do, and, and all that process. And this was in Hammer, and Hammer is a nomadic, partly nomadic, partly, and they settle and have also some agriculture, but they have really incredible culture called, um, so, I mean, their, their culture is very sophisticated, but this one is this bull jumping ceremony, which is a very well-known, famous for among tourists, is that they're basically the person before basically able to demonstrate they can form a family, they have to perform a certain event, which is called a bull jumping. And that is a, a person will just basically be necked and run across seven uh, bulls that are held uh, long together. And if they fail, then they can't form a family. So that's just basically a driving license uh, type for uh, being a complete person. And it's really, this culture really depends on, determines, for example, whether the person is even able, able to own a cattle and uh, and also to be buried properly you know it's basically just transformation and it's really we learned the culture and one of the things that we learned is that really the community so together despite a lot of like uh, outside community coming in contact with them they kept their identity and we wanted to learn more what kind of teaching will allow that kind of bonding and not even accepting rejecting the outside world one can see just that there must be some kind of teaching that the community is doing on children who wanted to learn and appreciate such that maybe that we can use that for our advantage in other places. Um, next, so again here in another uh, Jinka Ari family, that this woman that you see her before, the, before we were going there, she was helping us, she was, she's a painter and she paints and she's a well-known painter there. She demonstrates how she makes colors and how she paints patterns. And there, there are many things, their houses are decorated, it's really beautiful houses. And so she was demonstrating and we invited her to be, to come with us and, uh, and show. Just after that, of course, she had to do uh, her work to survive. And here is in, in the other family that the children showed us their dance, the Ari dance is really incredibly powerful. Like it's coming now, it's getting more popular in Ethiopia. And I, I imagine will be more popular even outside Ethiopia. It's a very beautiful, different tune. And here after dancing with them and they teach us how to dance, um, this was just a group picture and the children posing with us. And the console, I think I, I, you know, I will not finish so much. I mean, a lot of things, but we learned the cultural structure, the relationship between console and the neighboring ones, their heroes, what is their pride and how the culture works. And we'll capitalize on that. So this is just the Konso village, which is a very uh, famous one. And this one is a Konso uh, farm, which is their most known. This is the, the entire Konso area is uh, world heritage because of their uh, agricultural, uh, particular their um, uh, irrigation system. And just this has been for hundreds of years at least. And the way that they cultivate, they, they use the same seed and get twice or three times a year um, uh, product, a yield from it. And we were learning from that. And we will use as a context. This is Dorze, and we were learning again the Dorze. The Dorze are famous. Basically, the entire Ethiopian textiles are done and weaved in, in Konso or by Konso people. And also, they are very famous for their food and, and dance. And so we this is just a demonstration. We went there, and we learned about their dance and their culture as well. And that will integrate again as a context to in all of our projects, we would just give it as an example and mention, relate with that, with the culture that they have. So this is uh, Arbamenj, just uh, with, it's called the God Bridge, uh, connecting the two big lakes in the area. And this is just a forest that is captivating. And we want, we are also planning a project along that by flying drones, taking pictures, and actually asking students to how do you count the number of trees, for example, and let them brainstorm in that, just go the process. Because if we know, then we, and then we will ask some questions like, why should we count 
the trees here and all that elements. So this is just a beautiful picture that we took in our pre-trip. And this, just at the beginning, when we enter, just before we enter our, like, um, uh, our destination, there is this the Tia Stele. This is 500 to 600 years old decorated gravestones, and they have a lot of meaning, but they're not well studied. And so this is, given that the area's history, written history are very small, we will capitalize on that. What does it mean? Who are living there? And just doing some kind of archeological uh, kind of questions. And the first thing that we, we plan to do if we succeed will be to basically um, decode these patterns and ask in WhatsApp people and in Facebook um, what this represents in their culture, in, in the entire um, sample, basically, in the entire the South Ethiopia, such that we can see who the people who are living in this area, in the Tia area, you know, where are they now? Uh, because there isn't a clear story now that, that's doing that. So kind of trying to also build and asking people, engaging them early with this uh, project, for example. And this is again in Hammer and the Hammer burial ceremony. And this is a photo was taken and given to us after we departed. But because we had contact in Hammer and Kayafer, this is an areas region, so we have been in contact and we asked them um, some of the part that we were unable to see at that time. The burial is just an incredible ceremony. And they basically uh, sent us um, the pictures afterwards when the event happens. So this is like the hammers have this story, like that once a person who's fully uh, human, so that means that the person has jumped a bull and a woman is married. So when they die, they don't just die unless you really fully accompany them. And to fully, at first they will be buried, but one time their ancestors, you know, their people, their children, their grandchildren have to perform a certain event called this uh, slaughtering 30, uh, cattle, so one cow and one um, goat slain each other and slaughtered, and then the process happens. And it was really, it's really a, an incredible ceremony. But we wanted to learn about the events such that just we see across the cultures we visit what are the similarities. And uh, um, so, for example, this kind of ceremony is very similar to the ceremony in Konso. And we, we can then relate, do you know that, you know, like, so we will be able to use this context, cultural context. So yeah, that is uh, my presentation. And uh, so at Astrobus um, Ethiopia, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, as well as Facebook. Please just follow us. Thank you. Yababal, thanks a lot for sharing your experience, perspective, and ambience of your project. We will back to you in Q&A session. Dear participants, please join in our panel through questions in the comments on the streaming platform or Facebook. Our next and final speaker for today, uh, Jasvi Deng. Living between the US and China, Jasvi Deng is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice mostly explores the inevitable failure of communication both at interpersonal and collective levels using social installations and announced performances and sculptural objects. Bank constructs situation as public interventions that aim to raise awareness of our social and cultural environment. In today's session, Jasfi will be presenting with a video she made that explains her ongoing project titled Stories from the Room, which is a participatory art project that travels between localities, bringing people together virtually, but physically at the same time. Jasfi, please lead the way. Hey guys, um, my name is Jess Fee. I'm an artist and I'm currently based in Xiamen, China. Um, just pop on here for a few minutes to say that I'm going to be talking about my current art project, Stories from the Room, and I made a video about it. And here you can learn more about the project and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.
てはこちら展覧会の話題です世界中で新型コロナウイルスが猛威を振るう中人々は何を考えどう生きているのかそんな思いを世界中の人が綴ったメールを現代アートとして展示するユニークな展覧会が北九州市若松区で開かれていますどんな内容なのか取材してきましたルーティーンが崩れすぎ自分のない生活リズムが整わない何をするにしても体がついていかない県内の方が6月に寄せたメールの文章ですコロナの時代人々はどんなことを感じているのかそうした思いを一度にメールで募集し集めた展覧会が開かれています会場は北九州市若松区の現代美術センター CCA 北九州のギャラリーです寄せられたメールはこのように一人一人個別のファイルを作って閉じられていますさらにあちらにはパソコンやプリンターまた段ボールも奥には置かれていてまるで企業のオフィスのようですよね実はこの空間全体が一つのアート作品なんですタイトルは部屋から届く物語
and very soon I was luckily invited by curator Piliana to join her research project As You Go, Roads Under Your Feet Towards the New Future. With the help of the network, Stories from the Room is getting realized in countries including China, Australia, Serbia, Kazakhstan, and Ethiopia. Shanghai was the first stop. Laris, director of the Rotban Art Museum, kindly offered me the entire museum building, a beautiful five-floor historical building, to install his Stories from the Room as commissioned work. I was back in China at the end of July last year, and life in China at the time was basically back to normal. So no more online exhibitions, and people can travel freely to all kinds of public spaces. But for this project, we decided to have the museum building remain closed to the public, only allowing contributors come to visit by appointments as a reminder of the ongoing closure and isolation we still face in other parts of the world. We allow a very limited number of visitors at a time to ensure an intimate viewing experience. Visitors are guided by volunteers to walk up the stairs floor by floor and explore by themselves. Each floor of the building is installed with a slightly different vibe. Copper boxes are stacked into different shapes, scattered in different floors, leaving enough space for people to walk around. Since installation is set right on the floor, much lower to eye level, human figures naturally become dominant when they're among the boxes. Therefore, empty spaces around installation becomes the stage, and the audience action of reading becomes the performance. Filters are designed to be heavier. They can be difficult to pull out from the boxes, so it does require extra effort from the audience in order to read. Another aspect of the performance in this work is how the museum staffs perform labor. As I mentioned earlier, their engagement in the work is significant. Taking care of the archive is indeed a labor-intensive job, and let me briefly explain this to you. So, first of all, we reply emails. We make sure to reply all of the emails. We download the writing, and we format them in a uniformed way. We print them, we label them, and then make sure that everything is put to the right spot. Developing relationships from and around my work has always been one of my biggest interests in art practice. In this work, I'm handling two relationships, which I see as performance. And I'm trying to involve these two relationships to become parts of the work itself. Comparing to the audience, the relationship with the institution might not be as apparent from the look of the exhibition, but it is the framework that supports the work and can directly determine its success or even failure. Working with institutions from different countries with different backgrounds, um, different skills, resources, working habit, or even working culture is very challenging. And that is the reason why I have to come up with structure that is flexible enough so to involve as it engages with a different local environment and social condition. Iterations in Central Asia and Africa will be very much different from what we've seen here. Um, for example, in terms of locations, they will take places in public areas or community lots instead of white cubes.
Take Serbia, our next stop, as an example. The project will be happening in Bor, a city known by its copper mine in eastern Serbia. Bor has a rather large population of Chinese because of its biggest employer, Zijing Mining, a Chinese mining company. Fun fact, I am currently located in Xiamen, Fujian, where the Zijing Mining is based. So coincidentally, there is this double relationship between these two cities. And we are collaborating with Public Library Board with the help of its senior librarian Violetta to install the archive of stories from the room as part of the library's permanent collection. And we made these open call posters in two different languages, both in Chinese and Serbian. And Violetta helped me to post these posters on the streets in Bor. So what I proposed is to have the archive simply presented directly on the shelves, blending in with other books and documents in the library. So visitors can discover the archive by walking past the shelf or by searching on the website. And I believe this will be for the first time where the work will be presented as its truest form as an archive, but still finding a balance to exist as an artwork. Jasvi, thanks a lot uh, for sharing your uh, practices of creating uh, the space for hearing uh, voices and telling their stories from different uh, spaces. And uh, may I invite our uh, speakers for our discussion and Q&A session and the audience if you didn't manage to leave your question in comments, uh, you can do it now. And um, we could start our discussion with my some general question, and it will be nice to continue with questions uh, f from you to each other, and we will also awaiting the question from our audience. Um, so. And thanks uh, for your sensitive and inspiring work. Uh, I learned a lot, and special for your, from your perspective of connecting technology, tradition, uh, the cultural heritage, and uh, interaction with communities, and creating this uh, space for dialogue and communication. Um, you have already. Uh, you have all arrived to your research and project uh, in specific location uh, with your own vision and ideas. And could you talk a little bit more how local knowledge and social culture context um, is um, maybe involved or uh, influence your attitudes, optics, perspectives? and maybe even ex explanation of the knowledge of models of your working. Thank you. So is it an order how we're talking or? You, you can just uh, answer if you want. Yeah, we don't have any uh, tools for raising hands or something. Yeah, if you want to speak, you just say. Yeah, I think it's from the Astrobus side, it's actually very much local um, in a way that local within the country, like that it's the challenge that we have, uh, as also the, the kind of the, com the context that we have um, in the country that we have to do differently. And again, then from that is just the, the project context. But when we travel, we also realize exactly um, that the most impact is um, we can make a, a lot more impact if we understand actually the local context. And usually that is not easy because it takes a lot of studying and that already requires also uh, time as well as also financial uh, resources. So, but 
what we are improving um, within the, just our principle of constantly trying to to make the project better is that to actually really get that context because impacts like on when the children every time we go for example in our previous ones we had if we had a story like from their own culture from their own um, you know if we mention their own heroes if we know the, the musicians there if we know the artists that come from from the, the role models people listen students listen students get proud and exactly that's our core fundamental um, principle which is stimulating you know the their getting their attention as well as also uh, allowing them to be more active thinkers instead of just passive gets more actualized through that so yeah like that's i would say um, context and understanding the context that the, the local basing our work within the local uh, situation is is something that's very fundamental and um, contributes to the success of the project thank you and i also wonder to know Yababal, maybe you are in touch with this uh, previous venues did you visit last year maybe they somehow um, use your models of working and implement some um, activities in their programs and um, i would say that the major influence we had was on working with our partners who are already established so they are not just projects but they are like the space ethiopian space science society is a society that is working across the whole country and because they took it as part of their project they have follow-ups in a very similar format so, so they get funding they apply funding with even the name called astrobus uh, ethiopia um, and they they hold events in a smaller scale um, so but we don't have i mean uh, one thing that we will improve and we haven't improved so far is this connection and in this uh, that means like after we leave we we don't have a system that actually uh, connects we started some kind of mentorship but that again is very isolated and i wouldn't say it's part of now the project but that like we are still in that process of like how do we integrate a continuous engagement and this year fortunately we will we are working because we were able to travel to the, the localities earlier and uh, ourselves we established uh, connection with uh, um, uh, initiatives in the local in that in, in, the, in that locality um, and so they will come with us so when we leave they will be still there and the students will be connected with them so they hopefully that will increase that the students have somebody at least to continue um, what you know the kind of the inspiration they had to build on top of that but so far the big influence we had is just influencing this Ethiopian space science society which is a lot more an outreach project to adopt it as our approach as their own method of working. Thank you. Kaya, Robert, Chasfi, could you like share what you learned from this local context? Thank you. I mean, our I can go first. Uh, inquiry is really uh, primarily theoretical, philosophical one. For sure, we uh, uh, we included uh, local knowledge uh, by interviews. I mean, uh, not not so much local, but maybe more knowledge from practice and combine this uh, more philosophical, theoretical, and consequently uh, abstract level with um, with knowledge uh, from uh, practice. But I think, yeah, if uh, we were to somehow more engage some local knowledge, we would probably have to go uh, a bit further uh, back uh, to the history uh, where, yeah, local knowledge is still existed. I don't think, uh, I mean, also we somehow concluded in our uh, paper that, yeah, during the, the socialist period in Yugoslavia, local knowledges were more or less, uh, let's say, destroyed or something like that. But definitely, if we would go further back in history, we would probably um be able to to find and uh, research more situation situated uh, knowledge is probably yeah
Thank you. Uh, so do we have someone also to answer this question or we can go through the to your question maybe to each other? Can you hear me all right? Yep. Um, okay. Um, I just wanted to say that my project started as um, as my my way of finding a a a certain degree of universality when we're all facing um, the pandemic or we're facing the same event probably first time as a globe in many many years and and in history of human maybe so. I started this project to see how people are sharing this experience, either um, in a similar situation or totally different situations. And then when this project encounters more and more different um, people from different localities, you, you do see that uh, maybe the idea of universality is a, an illusion and then people do have very different situations, even though we are all facing the same difficulties. And I think maybe that's the reason why, or that's my strategy of dealing with um, the, the problem of locality, because I, I don't know all these places and I don't have a very um, a rich uh, knowledge about all these places um, culturally or geologically. So my strategy would be to develop a structure that that could be flexible and simple enough but but still i, I do face um uh, difficulties because although i'm collecting texts from people um uh, but we know that not all people you know share writing languages or they, they depend on oral histories and then uh, that that become a challenge for me, like how to really um, invite people from all these different backgrounds and have different hobby of sharing or documenting their lives. Thank you. And um, we have the question from our audience for Yabebal. Uh, I will read it for you now. Uh, if uh, uh, question uh, to Yabebal, the the flow of the knowledge in your turning turning uh, to school and to community seems quite different. Could you elaborate a bit more in terms of the exchange of the knowledge? I was wondering if you have included the elements of scientific education in your tour uh, to the South, such as introducing the telescope to the local communities, and what did you learn from the people know for their blacksmith craftsmanship? Sorry, it's... No, it's so from the past, um, like in the, in the past, we didn't have the chance to travel in advance. And so we're a lot more relying with people, like our team members, um, they, some of them were coming from those areas. So they know, like, so for example, a, a lot of them, astronomers, they know that, so we had a professional on Ethiopian astronomy, who is quite, who wrote a couple of books and who's traveling with us. So they were able to kind of uh, make that marriage between the local knowledge as well as also how um, like what we travel with in terms of here like in the south i think the the south is quite a diverse one and we don't have also because it's also smaller and some for example we don't have yet anybody from the ari um like other than the tourist guide who's himself from from the ari and who can talk to us we don't have a role model or the one who's traveling with us who would kind of uh, demonstrate. So what we do normally is that, so the telescopes basically, I think we focus a lot more like this learning the property of materials, like in a way, a property of anything, a property of even how that culture um, 
survives this way is by itself uh, the one. So telescopes, we don't have that teaching element in any of our projects. And the whole point is that for people to, like if it's a telescope that we allow them to ask um, and to interact with it, and then to find some use for it, and then for us to give that kind of um, explanation in light of like, if you, you could, for example, if you have this telescope, you could actually use it to see distant objects, right? And that is usually important during, you know, conflicts or during, so in particular in the past, I mean, now, um, so there will be a lot more like these questions that are coming from, from them, or we would ask them like, take this mobile and now you are uh, expected to like, for example, one of them is just like uh, clouds, right? So just count the amount of cloud that is there. And then we try to just allude them into thinking like, okay, there is a sensor called this, you know, like um, the light sensor and the light sensor would, would kind of be influenced when a cloud is in between the sun and that, and probably we can use it. So a lot more, we, we are more ad hoc in that sense, but we, it's about, as I said, it's a lot more about, can we get their attention? So that is the, the just the inspiration part. And then can we give them something that we will then um, take that and, and get pride out of it or get some value out of it? So it's only within that, but we don't have a formal STEM or science or any other strategy that we are at the moment uh, following. Sorry for making it long. Thank you. And Robert Kaya, do you want to share also how you are working with uh, the scientific collaboration in our uh, theory that you are uh, working with a philosopher from China and uh, his ideas and how this uh, implementation and the process of uh, situated knowledge in uh, war are going also in your um, um, way of communication with the Yukhui also? <clears throat> uh, maybe I, I could start. Um, there was no communication with Yukhui. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why uh, he didn't uh, answer our emails or whatever. Um, but actually that's, that, that was not a problem for this research because, um, Yuku is a philosopher, so, um, and philosophers are dealing with, you know, theories, uh, concepts and so on. So, uh, we can read them and try to understand. And, um, this idea of, of cosmotechnics, so his idea actually um we we try somehow to to present it um today in our presentation but also it was let's say uh, our initial um, initial um our starting point to to somehow um think about uh, bohr's mind in relation to um this local local knowledge so situated lot knowledge there and um our example was uh, our case study actually was uh, as uh, you could you can hear today um the development of uh, computer technology in yugoslavia in bor and um it is hard to talk about uh, situated knowledge in that sense uh, because if we if we take uh, this philosophical idea of Yukhui about cosmotechnics, uh, he's asking um, he's asking um, himself and of course others um, about situated knowledge in the field of uh, of compute of technology um and uh, this is not just a knowledge uh, of uh, if, if you're if we take for example the the software development or people are programming then on one level the knowledge is actually the same in 
in the West, in the East, and so on. So people are learning some concepts, some methods, how to how to program, how to deal with this. And um, it's hard to talk about where the local uh, uh, local knowledge is uh, coming in in this um, in this sense. Um, but yeah, uh, situated knowledge is very important because it, we always start from context. And um, in our research, it was really important um, to work with um, Dragons so, uh, from uh, Bohr's library um, to to speak with uh, people there. So people who who are working now in the mine or uh, have have been working in the past and uh, we try to gain some some knowledge from them some situated knowledge about how they understand uh, particularly how they understand um, the the situation in Bohr in general uh, and how they understand uh, the situation of uh, Bohr's past in Yugoslavia uh, from this perspective of, let's say, uh, their understanding of technology, computational technologies, so informational technology, and so on. So I would say that this is uh, somehow uh, was our method how to uh, situate knowledge in this uh, project. Thank you. True people. And uh... Jaspi, you are also uh, working with Bohr Library. Um, did you manage to maybe think and collect the stories from the Bohr? Maybe you could share with us some. Um, yeah, we started the open call uh, a while ago and we did receive some um, submissions from the public. But and, and I'm very thankful that Violetta, she is very open to um, the ways of collaboration and she's totally fine with any idea that I would have. So, but we're still finalizing on how this project will be displayed or, or will be, um, yeah, finally displayed to the public. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, uh, I think it's time if you have question for each other, we can start with them and I will check if we have also uh, some more questions from audience. No, we do not have yet. So please go ahead or, or any suggestion, I don't know. <laughs> um. I, I'm, I'm thinking about this uh, just earlier, um, what Robert said, and I have a question on that. So in this philosophical uh, understanding of the situational knowledge, um, is there an argument or is there a kind of evidence or support or philosophical uh, thinking where even just as, as the example you gave programming, some cultures are more situated to benefits because it is kind of probably in line with their way of thinking versus other cultures which kind of would be struggling because the way that it's dictated um how to program is in you know in contrary to their way of thinking is is that something that culture even comes or locality comes within within that philosophy or is it something um, to outlier. Uh, I think that is exactly that. So I think this is a good, um, a good way to put it. Um, uh, how, how the, um, this tension, let's say between, uh, between, um, local knowledge and, and uh, methodology, um, methodology that you, you have to use to do something. And um, 
so I think, yeah, but um, in philosophy, but not in philosophy in, in general, I'm not a philosopher. Um, just, we were just working with this concept of uh, cosmotechnics um, from Yukhoi. Um, and actually, I think he's asking uh, that question. So where, where to find this um, local implementation of, of more? um more global um global concepts or techniques in that particular case and so on so i think that yeah, this is a great way to put it this tension that you mentioned between um uh, between local and the global this let's say thank you and kaya do you have to add something Okay, um, if we doesn't have question for each other, you may close your discussion. And because I don't, I do not see the question. Maybe, maybe later they will be appear on Facebook. You can you can go in and answer for them directly on the uh, live streaming part and. Mm. So, what? Okay. <laughs> no, 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 not, not, not right now. I have some few words for you. And yeah, so thank you very much for your contributions and attention and time. And yeah, we can see that uh, situated knowledge and practice uh, is created and occurs in interaction not only with the objects, uh, of research and uh, our own projects and ideas, but also with the implementation in the, this uh, local context, and we, but but also in connection with the uh, with the uh, involvement of communities. And actually, at um, yeah, in yes, as yesterday panel, we also talk uh, talked about uh, the importance of the involvement of the communities in our practices, and, and also uh, this is important part of uh, the creating and producing the knowledge. And um, so, um, thank you for all of you. And the symposium will continue on Monday uh, by the panel, uh, the importance of the ports um, with uh, at the same time through the same link. So please, uh, please uh, be part of uh, as you go symposium. See you. We are closing for day of the symposium and a thank to presenters as well as I get in for moderating. See you at the same time, same place.